All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Making Multifamily Money. So I'm very excited to bring Alex here. So Alex actually works in the healthcare profession like myself. Uh, he's a respiratory therapist. For those you don't know, I'm a pharmacist. Welcome to the show, Alex. How are you? Steven, man, thanks for inviting me here. We finally made it happen. We've been going back and forth on it. Uh, I'm glad to be here. No, I'm glad we can finally make something happen. I know we've been in touch a while and I actually brought on, I think your, your partner, Savannah, uh, on to oh. one of my podcasts um, for one episode, uh, actually. Yeah. And she was like super nice <laughs> and accommodating yeah. of my crazy work schedule, top yeah, of what yeah. I do, man. But no, thanks for hopping on. And just to kind of start, can you kind of share about yourself and, and your real estate journey? Yeah, for those that don't know, uh, Alex Sabio, married father of four. I do have a W-2 job. I'm in healthcare. I've been a respiratory therapist for going on 21 years now. In a blink of an eye, I'm the old guy at work, right? Um, so what I can tell you is I wish I had, my story was like the gurus say, like, you know, they went from zero to, uh, you know, a thousand units in two years. But I think my journey is a lot more common than and what a lot of other people go through is that they made mistakes along the way. Right. And I started investing early to mid 2000s, uh, was greatly affected by the 2008 recession, um, had some failures there, eventually started scaling my business back up, kept a lot of long term rentals. Uh, um, you know, in my portfolio and over time they went up in value over time, the tenants kind of paid off their, uh, mortgages over time, the mortgage rates went down and I saw opportunities to do some cash out refinances and really found a niche in short-term rentals. And I started investing exactly three years ago in short-term rentals. And we scaled that portfolio to six, uh, short-term rentals, um, actually wound up selling all my long-term rentals because we went all in because we really enjoy the space uh, and then eventually we started a fund and that fund purchased our first asset so we purchased a 76 unit hotel so you know we're still growing that portfolio okay wow you just uh, gl glazed over <laughs> like 50 years worth of stuff in about two minutes it, i want to bring it kind of back like so so when did you graduate from respiratory therapy school like when did you actually work as a respiratory uh, therapist sure 2000 uh 2002 yeah it started okay. yeah 21 years ago so so 2002 and then for those who don't know like what's kind of the typical salary range of like respiratory therapists just just for some context yeah so we're probably like probably 20 to 25 percent lower base salary than than an rn right um i work acute care here in southern california i could tell you my base rate i work for kaiser uh, i don't know if um your viewers out there know Kaiser, but we they pay very well and they um, they give very good benefits. So I'm in the sixty dollar range, sixty dollars an hour. Um, wow. Used to work tons of overtime. Don't do any more overtime anymore. Refuse. It's kind of done a one eighty on that. Where I used to work six seven days a week, and now I just work the the bare minimum three days a week now. So wow, wow, yeah. So you know, for those who don't know, farmers a starting salary is typically at least back. You know, when I graduated in 2013, it was around like 60 bucks an hour as well. But mm -hmm. we come out with $250,000 of student debt, and it's a, it's a yeah. top level degree. Right. Um, but I know Kaiser, as you mentioned, they pay higher, right? Like yeah. pharmacists, it's probably like if you're experienced, like 80 to 90 um, yes. an hour. Um, but was that what you made starting off, like when you first no. graduated? No, I started 19 bucks an hour and I thought I hit it big. <laughs> oh, exactly. I, 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 <laughs> that's why I wanted to hit that point. So when you came out making 20 bucks an hour, did you have any student debt or was it just all paid for and covered? For that's it? a good thing. I tell people like respiratory therapy is one of the biggest bangs for your buck out there. I mean, I went to community college and I had $4,000 in debt. Uh, and we paid it off within like maybe a few months of just working crazy overtime. Um, yeah. And my wife, who's also a respiratory therapist, she's retired now because she does um, the real estate stuff on the side here. Um, but she was also a respiratory therapist. Okay. Okay. And, and then uh, I guess from when you became a respiratory therapist, when did you start investing in real estate? Like what was that time gap? Yeah, almost right away because in 2002, like the real estate market was going up and, you know, I was working night shift. And for those of you that uh, work night shift, uh, acute care, there's all these infomercials that come on. 
right? And in the ICUs, the TVs would be on and all of my patients are intubated. And I would look up and I would hear this guy, Carlton Sheets, talking about <laughs> low money, zero down uh, real estate. And I bought his horse back then, there were CDs, uh, listened to everything and it resonated with me. And I can tell you that uh, my grandparents owned a, owned a boarding care facility here in Southern California, very Filipino thing to do. Yeah. Uh, but they made a lot of money and I remember them owning a lot of different real estate. Um, and one thing they told me is when I purchased my uh, my primary residence, um, they said, you know what? We never really made good money until we, we invested in real estate. And for some reason that stuck with me. It's not like she was giving me mind blowing advice or anything like that, but there are these statements every now and then that people tell you and it just sticks with you. And I knew that that was gonna be my path. That just really appealed to me. So I wanna say my first investment property was 2004, okay. somewhere around there, yeah. Wow, so basically in about two years of, of working at 20 bucks an hour, you basically got your first single family home, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, and I would say I—I I mean, we bought our first primary home, okay. and back then the 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 market was jumping; it was going crazy. And within uh, less than a year, the property went up a hundred thousand dollars in value, and we wound up selling it and to get a brand new home. And at that time, as a RT, I'm only making about she's I think my base pays forty thousand dollars or forty five thousand yeah. dollars, and here I was like the home went up a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. I'm like, well, there's something to this. Like, we need to just keep like rinsing and repeating and 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 figuring this process out. Yeah, yeah. can you kind of break down the numbers in your first deal? Like, how, how'd you save up for that down payment? Like, what was that process like? And like, kind of numbers on your first single family home? Well, I could tell you, like I said, I made a lot of mistakes. And the first deal I made yeah. was a scam. And I lost 16 grand on that deal. Wow. And so what happened was I, I bought my home and I, I sold it for like $100,000 in, um, in profit, wound up buying a brand new home. But it was weird because um, I said, wait, we still have, a, uh, at that time they were giving 80, 20 loans and I had like a home equity line of credit. <laughs> and we had, I think $16,000 or 30,000, I forget what the number is. And I said, you know what? I don't know why we sold our first house. We should have kept that and just kept it as a as a rental. Like we we had this fear of buying this brand new home and we needed to put some down payment downs to make our payment lower. But we put a 5% down, but yeah, our, our monthly payment went down like 200 bucks or something like that. Mm -hmm. Why not just reinvest it? So I remember we invested in something. It was a duplex in Colorado and that wound up being a scam. The guy wound up going to uh, prison. It was a pyramid scheme. And uh, for some reason, right, I should have stopped dead in my tracks there. Like you're an awful investor. I don't know what, what you're doing. And um, back then the internet wasn't a big thing. So like the research really was just talking to another nurse who was doing the same exact thing. And I said, oh, maybe that's something I wanna try. Um, luckily around the same exact time they were giving 80, 20 loans. So you didn't have to put any money down. So with my, my first true investment, was a single family home in Durham, North Carolina, 3-2, uh, brand new construction on a lake. And I wanna say it was $132,000 purchase price. Wow, okay, so you basically got 132K house, zero dollars down? Yeah, pretty much. It was a thousand dollar earnest money. And I remember at closing, I got back like a $700 check. So like 300 <laughs> bucks out of pocket. What I can tell you is that that property negative cash flowed. I yeah. think, uh, um, my uh, mortgage was probably like 1200 and mm -hmm. the tenant, uh, which I was lucky enough, it was a, a nurse. Um, she stayed with me for like 15 years. Wow. Like I had zero turnovers and um, it took about a good five years or so for it to just start barely breaking even. But in my mind, Steven, I, it was like, hey, it would take me forever to save up this money for the down payment at least here I'm in the game, like almost four, and I would negative cash flow like 100, 200 bucks a month, but I was like almost forcing saving, if that made sense. And I got to learn a business, got some nice tax breaks, and it appreciated over time, so. Yeah, no, I like you shared that nugget because basically you, you have a very good mindset. And what I kind of want to highlight is you think differently, right? Mm -hmm. Like most people, you know, with the first failure, you get scammed, right? Like you could just yeah. quit right there. A lot of people can, and you can say, hey, I tried, I failed, and that's it, right? Like no regrets. 
Right. But uh, it seems like you had something planted inside of you, you know, early on, maybe from your grandparents. But you just said, hey, like, I can buy this property. And, or have you ever even been at North Carolina Durham at that time? Or did you buy this kind of like sight unseen? I bought it sight unseen. And it was yeah. weird because at, at that time, the Internet was just starting to break out. <laughs> And there was this group called Marshall Reddick uh, Real Estate Network. Uh, they're based in uh, Irvine. And they were trying to sell the idea that you can buy a home at around $100,000 brand new turnkey out of state. And at the time, the homes here, the average home in Southern California, believe it or not, was $250,000, mm -hmm. somewhere around there, right? Wow. And and like Carlton Sheets was saying when I, I listened to those CDs, he said, you got to hit the 1% rule. And I'm like, well, there's no way people are renting stuff out for $2,500. Um, that doesn't make sense to me. Looking back at it now, I should have, because uh, the appreciation was phenomenal here. But you know, in the Midwest and all of these other states, um, they were hitting the 1% rule very easy. For me, I wanted it to be brand new. So I was willing to pay a little bit more to not hit that 1% rule. Like maybe it was like 0.9% of whatever the purchase price was, so. Okay. Cause, cause yeah, I mean, like you were negative, you know, where 200 bucks a month, you know, you luckily have no vacancy, but you know, you're working, right? Like you're still yeah. working in W2. So you can kind of take that hit. That, that's kind of what I did when I started off house hacking in California, like good luck in California cash flowing, right? Yeah. <laughs> cash California is, is pure appreciation. You know, my first house hack, I just bought for a hundred thousand. I lived in the master, rented out the three other bedrooms for a thousand each. And mm -hmm. that just basically covered my mortgage. And I think my expense was about 1500 um you know including the property tax insurance and utilities um you know yes i had to share with um you know three other tenants right. but I, I was you know young at the time still and uh i was had that college mentality of like i'm just used to having like roommates if that yeah. made sense and like you said you're kind of paying yourself right like mm. you have to live somewhere in the bay area you know rents can be like three thousand bucks for one bedroom yeah. so in my mind i was like well i'm paying 1500 bucks that's half the rent and I'm just paying myself essentially. It's a, it's a forced yeah. savings. But when I left the house and I still kept it, I rented it out just like you, I'm negative cash flow, right? I was yeah. like negative probably like 500 bucks a month or something like that, not including like right. CapEx. But that property in five years appreciated by half a million dollars. Wow. Right. Yeah. So I bought for 800 in 2017. Fast forward to today, it's worth 1.3 million. Yeah, there's no way you work as much overtime as you can to save yeah. up half a million bucks in five years. That doesn't happen, right? And you know, like I said, I was negative cash flow, right? I'm negative 500 bucks a month, which is like 6,000 a year, you know, times that by five years, that's negative 30. I mean, now it break even, I, I refinanced to a lower interest rate, rents went up organically, mm -hmm. right? So right. now I'm breaking even minus, you know, CapEx, but like the equity, my wealth was made in the shadow, like kind of behind the scenes in that appreciation. So it, it's a great play to do if you don't mind a W-2, but you know, if you want to leave a W-2, you know, obviously you can't stack these properties when, when you're like negative cash flow. So, right. um, no, like I, I definitely agree. Like the 1% rule, it usually markets that hit it, the appreciation is not going to be as good. Right. Um, so it's a give and take, right? It's definitely right. a give and take. On that and I day. find, I think people don't see that, right, Stephen? Like people don't see all the crap that you go through as a real estate investor. Yes, people post on Instagram like, hey, my net worth is five, 10 million bucks or whatever it is. But man, you put up a lot of sacrifice. Oh, yeah. Sacrifice, capital, risk. Um, that's the one thing you'll have to do. Like scared money don't make money. So you gotta put your money out there um, to make some money, so. No, I, I love you said that because when, when you invest in real estate, so like me, I own 90 units, right? And a lot of people from the outside think like, oh, wow, this guy should be like so rich, uh, retired. And yes, assuming they're stabilized, right? Yeah. Um, but in the process of stabilizing it, you're putting a lot of money into the properties. Any excess cash flow, you're pumping back for renovations. I'm putting my mm -hmm. own money into renovations. So I'm the little definition of like asset rich cash poor right now, yes. right? <laughs> Until yeah. I unload one of my properties and at that point I'll get a, a lump sum of, of my money. So I think people don't realize it. I mean, it's kind of glorified on, on social media and YouTube as, as you know, like people mm -hmm. flex a lot, but as a, someone who operates in money, I know like the behind the scenes, like it's not as glamorous as it, no. it seems. Um, no one talks about the failures. I'm a little bit reversed. I talk about like everything I failed at. <laughs> yes, me too. Uh, just to, to for, for me to remember and want people to learn as well. So um, 
yeah, anyways, I kind of digressed there a bit, but <laughs> I guess after that, that first single family home, uh, when did you get your next one? Uh, like a few, like a few months later or something like that. For, for some reason, I didn't learn my lesson to where I was negative cash flowing, wound up buying another one in Houston, Texas with the same company. Mm -hmm. I w remember visiting, um, this place in Pasadena and there was, um, uh, a realtor that spoke highly about investing in Texas, why Texas is such a great market and why Houston is. And at the end of it, he said, Hey, I have a list of homes for sale. And this line of people just went there. And it was crazy because people were just picking them out and we're like, Oh my God, we're not going to get a home. But back then, like I said, you didn't put uh, any money down. At this one we actually did buy uh, for like, I want to say $120,000, but we actually did put 5% down on this one. We we're like, Okay, I think uh, we'd like a little bit lower payment. So we put, I don't know, five, 6,000 bucks down or something like that. Uh, that one negative cash flowed as well for a while. Um, and it was kind of like the same thing. It took like five years or so, um, for it to like start breaking even interest rates went down, you know, uh, wound up refinancing stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, uh we kind of kept going through that process and it kind of led me to one of my biggest failures, which was here in, uh, Southern California near a hospital I was working at. I was, remind you, I was buying all these properties that were like four, uh, or a hundred thousand dollars around that range. I wound up buying a property here in Southern California for four hundred fifty thousand dollars in two thousand eight, and it seemed like the second I signed the papers, the government was watching me, and they said, "Let's crash this market." Yeah, <laughs> and and that's exactly what happened. I bought at the height of the market, and that was a tough thing to recover from. So this is another failure, right? But uh, for some reason, I kept going. I don't know what it was, you know. Let's 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 backtrack. Tell me about that that property you bought near the hospital. Like, what what was kind of the down payment? What was kind of your rents? And, yeah, um, yeah. So the thing is, that property was brand new. So you're starting to see a trend. Like yeah. early on in my investing career, I didn't want to do the work. Right. And I, I, and so I, I liked stuff that was a little bit more turnkey and I was okay with a little bit less cash flow. And so, um, at the time I said, you know what, this property is in a gold mine. Cause I work at this large teaching hospital. I could always rent this thing out. And the funny thing is if I kept this property, I would have made a killing, but oh, in yeah. the end it was like, oh, I just couldn't do it anymore. But anyway, I bought it for, you know, mid four hundreds. Don't remember the purchase price. Um, at the time I put zero down because wow. they were doing 80, 80, 20 loans. They weren't, you know, you didn't need to put any money down. Um, and at the time I said, mm, I think I could rent this out for about $2,200 a month. But in the end, my mortgage was like 3,200 bucks. And I'm like, oh shoot, it was a negative a thousand bucks. But I had already um, been negative cash flowing on a lot of these properties. And I was like, mm, I, you know, I, I kind of did the calculation. Okay, I'll be negative a thousand bucks, but I think in the next two, three years, it's gonna be worth this much. But in the end, I bought it for, let's say 450, whatever the purchase price was like two three years later it was worth two hundred thirty thousand dollars wow right? and, and that's when the market just completely crashed it just kept going down and i couldn't offload the property anymore um this was my first like real clue into real estate because i tried to self-manage this as a long-term rental and made almost every mistake in the book i think i was renting it out for two thousand bucks a month and that's if they paid on time or if they paid at all and so at a certain point, you're negative, like over 12, 13, $1,400, um, you run out of time, money, money and energy. So that's kind of at one point I walked away from it. Yeah, no. So at the time you bought it, were your other two rentals that you bought, were they just breaking even at that point or were they still negative as well? At that point, I think they were starting to um, um, maybe cash flow a little bit. If anything, okay. maybe 50 bucks or something like that, right? So at, at that point, the lenders could be like, okay, at least these two are like kind of breaking even. This one you're buying, you know, you're going to be negative, but you're working a W-2. So that's probably their rationale. I, to be honest with you, Stephen, I don't even think they looked. I mean, back then they were giving loans out to anyone that signed on the dotted line, yeah. um, so, which is what kind of got us into the mess that we're in now or like back then. Um, so... Yeah, it, it, it was, I think I used the um, the builder's like uh, lender at that time. And the, wow. it, 
one of the big things was like, oh, they were giving like a $10,000 credit or, or something like that. And I said, oh, okay, let me do it. And then I saw a few people buying in the neighborhood and I said, oh, I and I really like the neighborhood, good school district and everything. But, you know, it just didn't work out. And, and that's the thing. Sometimes things don't work out. Uh, I think people try to find the home run deal right off the bat. Sometimes when you first learn to swing a bat, you're probably going to strike out or maybe foul tip a ball. Hopefully you get a base hit. Might be miraculous where you get a home run, but I rarely see it. So for me, it's a numbers game. Uh, and then you're going to start learning from your mistakes. In the end, I'm glad all of that happened because I would have never got to the point where I'm at today. Like yeah. imagine if those property 